Hi, welcome to the Nazareth to Nicaea podcast and vodcast, the show where we cover the historical Jesus, the Christ of faith and everything in between with your host, Mike Bird. Well, hello everyone. Christmas greetings to you. It's Mike Bird here on the Nazareth to Nicaea podcast and vodcast. Uh, today, I want to look at the Christology of Christmas. You know, and this look, once you mentioned Christmas, there are a whole bunch of red herrings that come up. People who want to discuss things like, isn't Christmas just a Christianization of a pagan winter festival? Uh, people want to raise, you know, some legitimate historical questions about the infancy narratives in the gospel. Um, is it just kind of made up to make Jesus look like he's the fulfillment of messianic prophecy, a type of you know, mythicism and midrash of the Old Testament that's been stitched together. We've got the question too of does Luke use and rely on Matthew as his source for his own infancy narrative or are these things kind of independent of each other? Uh, where does John get his stuff from? And he doesn't really go into the infancy narrative, but John's got his own independent tradition. Uh, he's focusing on the word made flesh, but where does that come from? And then people want to know, well, why is it that Mark, our earliest gospel, and Paul, our earliest Christian writer, uh, neither of them really say much or even imply much about the birth of Jesus. I mean, we could we could go into all those questions, but I'm not going to. They're happening in a, a different seminar room. I just, I just want to talk about today, briefly, the Christmas Christologies of Matthew, Luke, and John. That's what I want to cover in brief. So uh, the first thing we could do, we've got to look at the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew is very big on the Messianic Jesus, if you like. I mean, the genealogy stresses that Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, he's the, the, the promised one who's come into the world. And I mean, in fact, 118 of Matthew's Gospels, it says, you know, now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place this way. So he's recounting the, the birth of this Messianic agent, this Messianic deliverer who Matthew goes on to emphasize is born of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he says that twice, is that it's through the agency of the Spirit that Jesus is born. Uh, the purpose of the advent of the coming of this messianic child is to save people from their sins. So that is that is the act of liberation, redemption. It's it's not the Romans. It's It's not merely from material or earthly travails, although the Messiah will, will go on to do quite a lot of that. Uh, it's saving God's people from their sins, since it's sin that seems to separate them from God. Uh, there's also that, myster that mysterious or curious quote from Isaiah 7.14. You know that the, uh, the virgin will, or the virgin, I should say in inverted commas, will give birth to a child. Uh, because the Hebrew word in uh, Isaiah 7 is Alma, which simply means a uh, young woman of marriageable age, whereas the Greek version that Matthew cites says Parthenos, which means more properly a, a virgin. So, I mean, there's all sorts of debates. I mean, what I think this is, this isn't a messianic prophecy. This is an element of what we call typology. The birth of Jesus is one who is destined to have a saving impact on God's people. Uh, that reminds Matthew of a similar event in the days of Isaiah, where a child who was born in, uh, in a, a time of great, great trial for Israel, uh, the birth of that child is proof that God's promises to deliver the nation at that time will come to fruition. So I think it's typology, not messianic prophecy. We've got the Magi as well coming from the East and they're very keen on uh, finding the Messiah because of the, the astral events that are happening around them. And when they come, they pay homage to Jesus. They do obeyance to him. They kind of, in a sense, worship him. Now that may not necessarily be divine worship, but they're certainly offering him a type of, well, like I said, a type of veneration. Uh, then things get a little bit peculiar in the narrative because there's a, uh, a quote from Hosea 11.1, 1, you know, out of Egypt I called my son, and you've got the flight of the holy family out of Israel where they go down to Egypt. Um, 
Herod the Great engages in this big massacre of the infants, kind of like, you know, like Moses trying to kill all the infants of the Hebrews. And what you have is a kind of reverse exodus because you've got kind of, you know, Herod as a kind of, you know, new pharaoh. Um, Israel then becomes the new Egypt because, you know, literally out of Egypt, I called my son. So it's, it's kind of like the like swapsies, you know, Israel has become Egypt and Egypt has now become Israel because the holy fa family is fleeing out of Israel and into Egypt. So, you know, that's that's an interesting bit of intertextuality, the way Matthew was using the quotation from Hosea 11.1 1, and also thinking about, you know, Herod, the Holy Family. It's kind of like a, a rehearsal of the entire story of Moses. We're also to told Jesus will be called a Nazarene. Now, that can often mean someone who's taken a... A vow of some kind, but in this case, it's associated with a small hamlet in Galilee. Um, you know what I think is the 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 main point in Matthew's Christology of Christmas. I think it's just, it clearly accents the messianic aspects, and I think Matthew is saying that Jesus is the long promised and long awaited Messiah in whom God draws near. That's why, because he, he's called Emmanuel. Now, you know, Emmanuel can mean a few different things. It can mean God with us, obviously. But, I mean, you can take that in the sense of a bit of royal rhetoric. It's, you know, it's, it's like an Isaiah 9, 6, where Israel's, you know, Davidic king is called El Gabor in Hebrew, mighty God. Or in the Septuagint, the Greek translation, he's called the Angel of the Great Council. He just could be a bit of you know a bit of royal rhetoric, laying on the lavish titles and quasi-divine qualities associated with Israel's king. But I, I tend to think that Matthew sees it in a slightly more realistic sense. Uh, Jesus is not simply a Davidic king of the normal earthly variety. Uh, I think Matthew believes that in Jesus, God has come near. So I think Matthew means Emmanuel less about rhetoric and more towards reality. But in any case, I think what Matthew emphasized is the advent, the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. What about Luke then? Uh, well, Luke's got also a very big and great story of the birth of Jesus. I mean, he's got his famous preface where he's talking to, you know, Theophilus about all the things he wants Theophilus to be very assured about. We've got the story of John the Baptist and, the, you know, the story of the, you know, the birth of John and the birth of Jesus. They're kind of intertwined and these two figures will be related to each other. Uh, but Luke does have an interesting way or a unique way or a kind of exciting way of describing the birth of Jesus, or at least, sorry, I should say the birth, the conception of Jesus. Uh, in chapter 1, verses 29 and following, he, he says how Mary was greatly troubled at his words, that's of the angel, and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Uh, now, there's a lot of lot of juicy themes there. We've got that of divine sonship, you know, son of the Most High. Uh, he's going to get the throne of his father David. These are clear messianic qualities, and, it, and it's going to be a kind of never-ending or everlasting kingdom. So, I mean, again, much like Matthew, there's a big emphasis on the messianic dimension to the identity of this child who has just been conceived, which Luke says is through the Holy Spirit overshadowing, you know, Mary, you know, what, what, whatever that means. Uh, when we get to the uh, speech of Zechariah, um, when he's celebrating the sort of, you know, the, the revelation of the birth of his own son, uh, he, he then kind of does a bit of a segue and talks about the Messiah. The Messiah is the one who will be a horn of salvation, okay? 
uh, then that, that, that horn is a symbol of strength and, and, and power. Uh, and there's also a very unique word used for the Messiah. And this is, I think, unique to Luke's gospel. He's called the day, day spring or the Anatole, literally the rising, you know, like the rising of the sun in the east. This, this is a very peculiar, well, I mean, unique, I should say, in the sense of peculiar, very unique description for a messianic figure. I, I th think from memory it's based on some particular verses in Zechariah. One of my former PhD students, David Wenkel, has done a short little book on the um, the image and the background of Jesus as the day spring. But what, you know, whatever it means, it means Jesus is marked out as the figure who brings deliverance and redemption. So again, a lot of, a lot of messianic imagery coming up, kind of rehearsing and utilizing images, language, and terms from the Old Testament. Now, I think Luke's gospel is also very interesting when you get to chapter two, because he then kind of gives a summary of what's happening in the Greco-Roman world at the time. And that's where he, it basically comes down to, well, who's the true rule of the world? Is it the son of Augustus, which was at the time Tiberius, or is it this new son of David, which is Jesus? So chapter two, I think sets up with, you know, who, who is really the ruler of the world, the, the, the son of Augustus or the son of David. Uh, but as things progress, we're now heading from the conception to the actual birth of Jesus. Um, angels tell the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news, a gospel that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David in Bethlehem, a savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. Uh, now that phrase, Messiah, the Lord, it can mean the, the Lord's Messiah, or it can mean something like the Messianic Lord, the anointed Lord. I mean, Luke's going to combine those terms uh, several times. He's going to do it again in, in 226. And these things, Messiah and Lord, are going to be uh, paired together throughout Luke and Acts. You know, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made lord and messiah so yeah i think what is what is interesting here is that not only is luke saying that the 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 birth of messiah is the, is is a big event for israel's deliverance he's kind of a son of god i mean i think that resonates with matthew but he also emphasized this this element of lordship the coming of the messianic lord and he's gonna he's gonna be a deliverer of israel but also as we'll find out uh, he'll also be a, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. That's what I think is Luke's unique angle here. Jesus is the messianic Lord of Israel's deliverance and even the salvation of the Gentiles. What about John then? It's like, uh, you know, <laughs> we could say a lot about John's gospel, but we want to be brief. We want to be brief. Uh, when John says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God, uh, and then talking about how all things came into being through the word, without him nothing has to be made, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He's he's trading in a lot of prior tradition. Okay, that's what you got to remember. Clearly, there's a big F, uh, a big allusion to Genesis one. You know, in the beginning, you know what God did. So we've got a new kind of a beginning, a new Genesis. In terms of the word as the agent or instrument of creation, um, th this, this is called demiurgy. This is where God creates in and through a particular craftsman. This is possibly riffing off Proverbs 8, but most likely, I think, the wisdom of Solomon 7. And the idea of the word becoming flesh and dwelling or tabernacling amongst the people, that really does remind us of Sirach 24, okay, where the the Torah comes and tabernacles amongst uh, the people. And that itself is a manifestation of the wisdom of God. And, and yet, at, in the midst of all that, with this, this idea of, you know, a, a new genesis of wisdom as the uh, agent of creation, wisdom and word are, are identified together with the sort of, you know, the, that, that, that idea of the, the Torah coming down and dwelling with Israel or wisdom coming down, getting a hostile reception and going back, a kind of variation of that is that John ties it to the person of Jesus and he ties it to a messianic narrative. I mean, that's what I think is really, uh, what, what is the big uh, creative 
artistry, what, what is the real thing that John is getting at in his gospel. I mean, John is bringing together the themes of creation, temple, you know, Torah, the wisdom of God through which all things are made. All those things are being telescoped and being put onto Jesus. And that's what I think the Christmas message means for John. New creation. Um, uh, the, the instrument of creation is coming into his own creation. And this is the one in whom the very wisdom of God uh, is found. And this is also the Messiah who will be presented to Israel. Uh, now, if we were to uh, you know, look at all this, put it all together, we can see some big themes. We can be some, see some big titles like you know, you know, Messiah seems to be repeated, certainly in Matthew and Luke, and it will eventually get developed in John. You know, the topic of Savior, Son of David, Son of God, and Lord. Uh, I think that's all good, but we shouldn't restrict ourselves to the titles. Okay, It's not just the titles that matter. There's more going on here. What I think is really happening, and this is the uh, the overall message, this is where the Christology of Christmas takes us, is into a gospel message of God's faithfulness to Israel, making good on the promises for Israel's deliverance, for the forgiveness of sins, that there's going to be a new exodus or or, or an end of exile or something like that. And if if I were to sum it up, I would put it like this. I would say in the in the birth narratives of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, they offered the early church ways of saying who Jesus is, hence the titles, why Jesus came, and sort of, you know, the prophetic background to it, the typology, uh, the purpose of his coming as well. That That's what they're really striking at. That's why the birth stories, I think, are put in the Gospels. They're kind of a clarification of who Jesus is. And they've all got something distinct at the same time. Uh, Matthew emphasizes, I think, Jesus' divine origins, you know, his supernatural birth. He's very big, too, on the messianic identity, his role as a new Moses. You know, he kind of flees from Egypt as well, except Egypt has now become Israel, and basically Herod is the, the new pharaoh. Um, Luke focuses on Jesus as uh, the one who is destined to have an exalted status. He's going to right all the wrongs. And of course, there's the big theme of the, his lordship. He's the messianic lord who will be a light to the nations. Uh, despite all the differences here, and they, and they do have their own you know, distinctive aspects and their own uh, unique features, all of the Gospels, and I'd include John here, affirm in their own way uh, through interweaving the Old Testament that with the testimony of key figures, the words uttered by some of the primary characters in the narrative, that they're all wanting to say that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah who brings salvation to the people. And God is not just with him, but is presented in him. Now, it's a little bit ambiguous. I mean, I don't think they're fully working out something uh, along the lines of incarnation. I think, well, although John is probably coming the closest, and and I think you know Matthew's you know God, you know Emmanuel God with us is certainly being very closer to that. But they 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 don't fully have it there yet. But they're hinting at something uh, towards that, or something that in other literature will develop into that. So I think the birth narratives lay a a solid foundation for understanding the significance of Jesus's life and ministry as portrayed in the rest of the Gospels. And I think you could make a fair case that the birth narratives really do enhance the story, not, not simply in the sense of providing the, um, the origin story of Jesus, kind of like, you know, how did Wolverine get his claws or, you know, um, how did Darth Vader rise to power? It's, it's not simply trying to, you know, fill in the backstory. I think they're telling the story in such a way as to, as to accent Jesus is the Messiah, the Messianic Lord, the Word made flesh. And the story of Israel, uh, the story of Israel's salvation, and indeed of that of the world, find its climax in him. And that's why his birth, the birth of the Messiah, is good news. And that's why it belongs in the books we call Gospels. So there you go. That, in a nutshell, is what I think of the Christology of Easter. 
Uh, I was going to do another episode on Revelation 12, which is my favourite way of telling the Christmas story. Uh, I won't spoil that for you now, but I, I think I'll hold that one out for next year. I think next year is when I'll, I'll really cover that one. Um, for the time being, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be the final episode of the year. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm planning to do a lot more episodes on Nazareth and Nicaea next year, hopefully one per month at least, uh, but we'll see how we go. Uh, otherwise, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, tell anyone who you think will be interested in it, and maybe they'll enjoy the program as well. Otherwise, have a blessed Christmas and a bright new year.